Think of that little blue oval on the front of a car, and a couple of years ago we would have immediately thought of dull and adventurous cars that had all the driving excitement of a wet weekend and the style statement of a bry nylon shirt. Well, Fords may not have been that exciting, but they were still some of the best sellers around. The Ford Escort is one of the top three best-selling cars of all time. But I'm afraid that that had little to do with their wonderful attributes. More to do with the fact that if you put people in an ice cream parlour filled with every flavour imaginable, from Caribbean Crush to Death by Chocolate to Rocky Road, most of them would still plump for dull, plain, good old-fashioned vanilla. Not exactly an inspired choice, but at least you know what you're getting. Now the top brass at Ford were well aware of their image, or should that be lack of one? And even if they did make their rivals weep when it came to the number of cars driven out of the showrooms, they decided to try and make our roads a prettier and more exciting place to be. Enter one crack design team and a new funky look called New Edge. New Edge design uh, is a new, a new way of thinking for Ford and uh, we are flowing the concept into most of our new models over the next few years. Um, if you take the, the cues from car and from Puma, uh, we flowed these uh, cues into, into Cougar uh, and extended it uh, a little bit further. Yes, from those high-tech design studios came cars that really wouldn't look out of place in the window of Harvey Nicks. First of all came the curvy car. Apart from looking so radically different to anything else on the road, it had a name that confused the hell out of everybody. It was the type of cute car that made its owners wave to each other, as they were obviously part of some new, very trendy club. The car really hit the mark and was quickly followed by the car that made driving enthusiasts everywhere drool and dribble at the thought of getting their hands on one. Ford's Puma was an instant hit. It looks amazing, is rewarding to drive, has bags of character and doesn't make a huge dent in your bank balance. Car buyers simply can't get enough of them and the Puma was the car that marked Ford's transition from frumpy to fantastic. And it left everyone wondering just what would come next. Well, here it is. Make way in the jungle for the latest big cat from Ford, the Cougar. When the concept was first unveiled, it produced gasps of delight. No one really believed that the actual car could be quite as stunning. But it is. This coupe is unmistakably big brother to the Puma. But at every turn, it's bolder, it's more exaggerated, it's simply more desirable. And where the car was unmistakably curvy, the Cougar is packed with angles. Its lines are strong, bold and they're razor sharp. Inside is a very different story. All the angles have disappeared, replaced instead by flowing lines, circles and swooping curves. Now the interior may not be quite as stylish as that as the Puma, but the Cougar is a very different car aimed at a different kind of driver. And there are still plenty of nice touches. Everything is well laid out, just where you want it to be. The driving position seems comfortable. And there's a couple of Cougar's heads around, just to remind you what car you're in. And for versatility, you can't beat the good old hatchback. And what an enormous load area. For once, you don't have to sacrifice space and versatility just to be able to make something of a style statement. And what a style statement it makes. This feast for the eyes puts the work of some of Italy's celebrated design studios to shame. The cat's eyes light up, they glare out at you. It simply doesn't have a bad angle and its presence on the road is undeniable. The surprise with the stylish Cougar is that it shares so much with that good old Rapmobile, the Ford Mondeo. They may well be brothers, but there's no prizes for guessing which one of them got the short straw. One thing you can't deny is that the Cougar's handling is that of a true sporting car. The uh, machined precision look, the uh, taut surfaces uh, and intersecting planes uh, that finish in some of the detailed edges uh, around the headlamps, for example, uh, the V on the bonnet, uh, the triangle around the mirror area and uh, culminating at the rear in very triangular uh, sharp featured tail lamps uh, and high mounted stop lamp. When the Cougar finally goes on sale in November it will be available with either a 2 litre or a rather more dynamic V6 engine under the bonnet. The 2 litre has a top speed of 130 miles per hour while the V6 will take you to 137 and will get you from 0 to 60 in around 8 seconds. 
not quite as impressive as some of its competition, but Ford are keen to point out that the Cougar isn't a supercharged sports car. Well, we had a, a huge advantage uh, in using Mondeo uh, as our core platform. Um, the performance of the car uh, in dynamically on the road uh, and in a straight line was uh, just right as a, uh, as a basis for this type of uh, sporty coupe. Um, and it allowed us to use uh, the under, underpinnings of the car, the basic chassis components and the platform floor, uh, and yet change everything on the upper part of the car, everything that the driver or people in the street can actually see, uh, and in particular the driver can touch and feel, uh, has been changed. Uh, and yet it's allowed us to keep the underpinning platform on Deo with the good solid dynamics uh, and performance of that vehicle uh, at uh, uh, re reduced engineering costs and resources which we can pass on to the customer uh, as a good value for money product. First impressions of the Cougar are that it's the king of the jungle. It's so full of spirit you just won't want to part with it. The big question of course is how much will this supercat set you back? Well, Ford is still keeping quiet on that one, but when it does go on sale, you can expect to pay somewhere between 19 and 22 grand for it. have done it again. With Cougar, they've managed to prove that they really are back on form. Producing cars for those of us who want something a little bit different from life. Those of us who, if faced with the choice, would pick death by chocolate over boring old vanilla any day of the week. The little Mazda MX-5 has become something of a modern day classic and with prices from just £15,500 it's no pipe dream for most people either. However, this is Men and Motors and just for the sake of argument I would like to question the macho appeal of the Mazda MX-5 because unlike the MG, the Fiat or the Alfa Romeo which all have a certain roughy tufty appeal the Mazda, like President Clinton, is actually something for the ladies. You don't agree? Well, some people would actually call this a hairdresser's car. And that's controversial, but I'm about to find out. Let's find out. Hi, Hi, Jeremy Taylor from Men and Motors. We're uh, testing out a Mazda MX-5 today. Do you think you right. just come and tell us what you think of it? Sure, yeah. Come and have a look. It's a nice gentleman come to tell us. What do you think? I mean, it's quite stark. Very nice, very nice. Beautiful, nice lines, yeah. Nice lines? Do you, do you like the soft top bit? Uh, being a hairdresser, yeah, of course. <laughs> what do you mean, being a hairdresser? All hairdressers are like tops down on cars, don't you know that? I didn't know that. I thought you'd hate having the top down because it would mess up your hair. Not with uh, today's styling products, no problem. Just hairspray, a bit of gel, that. bit of wax sorted. So there you have it. Conclusive proof from our resident hairdressing expert that some hairdressers really do like the Mazda MX-5. You see, the MX-5 is all about image. You wouldn't buy it to drive up and down the motorway all day. And it's not big enough for him and her plus the baby. And although the boot is much bigger than the old car, it's still not big enough to be called a load carrier. The MX-5 is fun. It's captured the imagination of a whole generation of drivers who perhaps in the 70s would have bought an MGB or a Triumph Spitfire. But because it's made by Mazda, the MX-5 is ultra reliable and cheap to run. And drivers start to feel like, well, like they can really drive, even when the road's wet and you're throwing it round a corner. And now there's a new Mazda MX-5 to mess your hair up in. The latest MX-5 offers better performance, handling and stability than the old car. OK, so the ride is firm, but you can still steer this car around the inside of a supermarket and squeeze through the checkout. It's so precise. The 5-speed gear change is superb. Its short, sharp shift means you can really enjoy the 1.8 or 1.6 litre engine options to the full. 
power output is up almost 25% on this 1.6, taking it to 60 miles per hour in 9.7 seconds. That slices almost a second off the old car's time, and it can rocket on to 118 miles per hour. But it's outside where the new Mazda MX-5 really scores. It's now got a much leaner, more purposeful look about it, and these long sleek lines that seem to run the full length of the bodywork really give it the edge. And if you move down to the front, the styling here has also been altered thanks to this larger front air intake. And also, probably the most noticeable thing about the new Mazda MX-5 is that those pop-up headlights have gone for good to be replaced by these oval units. And that also helps with fuel economy too. The MX-5 feels, well, cosy and snug inside. If you're looking for practical changes to the new car, this centre console adds a bit more storage. There are the standard issue twin cup holders inside too. You now get an instrument panel pocket, lockable glove box and door pockets in both doors. Twin airbags are also standard. Do you think we've forgotten something? You're absolutely right, it's the hood. But this is the simplest hood in the world. It would actually be more complicated if it was electric. All you've got to do is press these two buttons, pull the levers back and shove. That's it. So that's about it. Fuel economy is up. Insurance racing start at Group 11 for this 1.6 car. And there are new bronze and green colours to choose from as well. In fact, if you bolt on a set of alloy wheels on the 1.6, it actually becomes a very smart little car. And OK, so it hasn't got central locking and it's got those strange window winder mechanisms on the door. But really, it's exceptional value. And let's face it, even your hairdresser would forsake his hair gel for a chance to get into one of these. I don't know about you, but I love buying classic car magazines, then leafing through the classified ads and dreaming about the sort of beautiful classic I'd really love to run. Well, this is the place where the dreams turn to harsh reality, when you have to bid for the car you want and put your name on the line at the bottom of the cheque. British car auctions, it's a Monday in December. Let's go and see what's on offer. The beautiful Lotus Elite, to my mind, one of the most elegant shapes ever built. Now, I used to have one of these cars when I was a local newspaper reporter in the 70s, and they gave me a Morris Minor as my staff car. And if we had to go more than 10 miles, we always took the Morris Minor because we could be sure of getting home. Whereas if we took the Elite, well, it was very problematical. However, if you want to sit in a famous seat, buy this car because it was originally supplied new to Earl Mountbatten and painted in his favourite colour scheme, Oxford over Cambridge. Uh, what's the interest been like, like in classics this year? This year it's been very strong. We've been very pleased to see a resurgence um, in interest from collectors and enthusiasts who I think really do drive the market these days. The days when uh, investors were getting into the market and prices were going sky high have long gone and what we have is a good honest marketplace that reflects the interest that we're seeing from enthusiasts today. But, but prices really are at rock bottom at the moment. Not so much rock bottom, I, I think the prices we're seeing today and other sales we've had during the year reflect if you like the true market value. Uh, when prices were inflated and prices were sky high obviously everyone's getting very excited but the real hardcore collector, the enthusiast, is out in force and uh, we have sort of three or four hundred registered buyers, so expecting a really good sale. Look at the leather in this one. There's a little split here and it hasn't really been looked after that well and you're looking at an awful lot of money to get something like this re-trimmed. So I, I'm always intrigued why people are selling cars here. They're so beautiful. How can you possibly part with them? Yes, it's like having a baby, really. I've had this car of mine, a V12 E-Type, for about uh, eight years. What sort of things do you look for? Well, I mean, the obvious things like this here, which shows that it's obviously been resprayed over not very good bodywork. I spent something like £13,500 on this car make it pristine. You're not selling this, are you? No, I'm not, no, no. The good old MGB has a huge following, quite rightly, and it's one of the most popular 
classic cars around for the simple reason that there isn't a single component part on this car that you can't replace from the body shell onwards. So it makes a great deal of sense. You can buy a really nice one for about 6,000 quid. Now I've really always fancied a Citroen SM. We used to run one on auto car as a long-term test car in the 70s and I loved driving it. Would I buy one today? Very complicated, lots to go wrong. 6,000 quid, six and a half thousand. You'd be taking a risk. And off, for 350, take the beginning by 71. Uh, please remember the next word of car is. What number 13 in your catalog? There we are. The uh, Paterni designed uh, 308 GT4, the uh, Ferrari Dino. Have a look at this, it's a 1976 example. Make no mistakes, the motor car is on sale at 7,006, 8,550. At the base of the steps, 8,550. Are we up? Selling this time, gentlemen, if you've all finished, 8,550 marks. Yes, 8,006 and 50. 8,650 at the base of the stairs again, twice, or none, 8,650. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Here it is. Now, if you really want to be noticed on the street, you couldn't do better than bid for a convertible ink caddy. And it's reported. People dream about Ferraris. Wouldn't it be fantastic to own one? But I simply couldn't afford the purchase price and I couldn't afford to run it. Well, this car sold at the car auction here today for £8,600. Whether you could afford to run it or not remains to be seen. Now, I said I always liked Citroen SMs and I thought it would go for around £6,000. In fact, the top bid was 4300 So why didn't I stick up my hand and bid for it? Well, perhaps the answer is I'm simply not brave enough. And the bottom line of any auction is you never really know what you're getting. So then, what's it look like? Well, there's not much immediately to give it away on the inside. But on the outside... <laughs> Howdy. The American market loves pickups. They buy them in their millions. It's the standard car over there. But their American tastes have never quite been European tastes. For instance, the Americans also like brightly coloured golfing trousers and incredibly large thighs. So their taste will never necessarily coincide exactly with ours. So it's a brave move to try and introduce the market with something really very new indeed that we're not used to. 50% of those pickups sold in America are the four cab derivatives and versions like this. So it does make sense if you are trying to educate the market to bring in something that has perhaps a little more practicality than an ordinary two-seater pickup ever would. Having said that, the practicality is pretty limited. Four-seater it might be, but if you've got four people, or even, as all the booklets say, possibly five, I don't know where you're gonna put the luggage. There is only one luggage space, and I'm standing in it. And if it were raining, I'd be getting wet. And if I were left overnight in it, I'd be stolen and all my serial numbers scratched off. Therefore, it's never gonna be as practical as a four before, an ordinary one that we already know. And at 20,000 pounds, more for this, with all the flashy chrome bits on, that's an awful lot of money. You could buy an awful lot of four before for that. No, primarily this car is about one thing and one thing only, image. It's about looking good. It is definitely more surfs up than mud plugging. Capable off-roader it may be, but at the end of the day, it's going to spend more time mounting the curbs outside the wine bars than ever it is tramping up and down over hill and dale.
Basically, it's a macho fielded thing. It doesn't take long to realise that this is no derivative of an ordinary car. It's obviously very much a, a purpose-built truck. And that has to be borne in mind when you're driving it around. It drives like a truck. It's got a lot more in common with a big 4x4 than it has with an ordinary car. On the road, it is pretty cumbersome. You're very much aware of the size of the thing and to drive. The steering feels pretty remote from the front wheels. The braking feels pretty remote from what's going on down there as well. But you would expect that. The ride is pretty wallowy and choppy. It kind of lollops rather than uh, cruises serenely. However, it would be unfair to ask it to do anything else. It's based upon very much a working vehicle. I suspect that it is a pretty capable thing off-road as well. I'm not about to try it because it get all muddy. However, we've got two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive. You can shift it between the two at up to 62 miles an hour, which is handy should the conditions change underfoot whilst you're on the move. There is also a low-ratio gearbox, and I'm sure this thing can do pretty much anything you or I would demand of it, unless you're very much into your off-roading. A few things as you're looking around the cab, I have to say, the wood, very much in inverted commas, is uh, horrible. You could cut your fingers off this stuff around the edges, frankly. The steering wheel is really not the most attractive of things, but there is an SRS airbag in there, which has got to be worth having. Generally, the interior, though, pretty inoffensive. Plastics may not be the highest quality, but again, this is derived from a working truck. Estate agents will tell you when buying a house that it's location, location, location. Anybody trying to sell you a car in this sector of the market will tell you it's image, image, image. And this is a prime example. After all, who really needs an enormous great 4x4, almost four-seater pickup? Very few people, really. But then who also needs a full-size 4x4? Very few. Or even, come to think of it, a coupe or a sports car. At the end of the day, the 4Life is very much a lifestyle image car. So it's a lifestyle decision. If it fits in with what you do, go for it.